Welcome to High Noon, where we discuss controversial subjects with interesting people. Today, we're joined by Robert Pendicio. Robert is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he writes incisively about education. Uh, before he was a think tanker, he was a civics teacher. And before that, he worked in the news business. Um, he's also the author of many books, but most recently, How the Other Half Learns, Equality, Excellence, and the Battle Over School Choice, which chronicles his observations of the successful but controversial Success Academy network of charter schools. Robert has been published in just about every worthy outlet imaginable from the Wall Street Journal to the Atlantic. Um, but what I particularly love about his work is that he has long been a champion of opening up um, what I think he has termed the black box of the classroom um, and actually talking and thinking about what kids are actually learning and what teachers are actually teaching, which as strange as it sounds, <laughs> that's actually really rare um, yeah. in among people in our crowd who work in education policy or education reform. Um, it seems like we really don't want to talk about what exactly is going on in the classroom and we prefer to focus on funding systems or uh, sort of uh, more policy oriented uh, conversations. But uh, Robert, welcome to High Noon. It's great to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, it, it's so amusing to hear you describe this you know, like through to other people because this is the reaction I get all the time, which is like, wait a minute, we really don't talk about what kids do all day? Seriously? Because if you're a mom, that's all you talk about, right? Is, you know, your kid's homework assignment and what their classes are. But those of us in education wonk world, you know, that's all beneath our dignity, I guess. <laughs> um, well, why don't we start out by talking a little bit about this this turn in your career, right? Because I believe you were already in your 30s. Um, you decided to quit a successful career in journalism. You were working at Time and Business Week, and yeah. you decided to teach civics to fifth graders in the Bronx. So what prompted you to do that? Well, I'd been drinking, you know, it was, <laughs> it's, I, 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 I joke, but it's really not a joke. I call it my mid-career impulse purchase. Um, you know, I, I've been 20 years in the media business. Um, I, I was the public affairs director for Time and for Business Week. And, um, you know, at the risk of being somewhat, um, you know, mawkish about it, 9-11 had just happened in New York City. And I think a lot of us, um, it was almost 40, um, were probably thinking, oh, you know, I, I could probably be doing something else right now, at least for temporarily. So, um, I was seduced by an ad on the New York City subway system for a program called the uh, the New York City Teaching Fellows. I will never forget this ad. It, it had this wonderful tagline. It said, you remember your first grade teacher's name. Who will remember yours? So, oh, that's good. So it just kind of caught me at the right time. And I'd, I'd long been involved in not-for-profit work in the South Bronx. I was on the board then and now of, a, of an organization called Eastside House Settlement, um, which while I've been on the board kind of went from cradle to grave social services to you know more educationally focused um, mission. I, I'd written a couple of kids books. I, I just had a kid. So it just kind of, you know, the, the, the sevens were popping up on the flight, or in this case, education, education, education were popping up on the slot machine of my life. and and. Um, I signed up for a two-year, what I thought would be a two-year mid-career public service stint uh, teaching, not not civics, that came later, but fifth grade uh, in the South Bronx at a, at a rather poor performing public school. That two-year mid-career pub public service stint turned into five years. I got very kind of um, agitated, I guess I'll say, uh, about certain issues in education, not the least of which is you know curriculum and instruction. Um, and it just became a second career. I mean, you know, it, it never, I never woke up one morning and said, I'm going to switch and go into education for the rest of my life, but it just kind of evolved that way. <laughs> um, so exactly the focus that you have, which is curriculum, although you also focus on instruction and, and the science of reading um, and all kinds of pragmatic aspects, but particularly civics instruction, which you did do for many years, um, you know, there's no doubt that parents across the country and school boards are engaged in in huge clashes now over sure. essentially the subject of civics, right? What students are going to learn in America about being American. Yeah. Um, and so you have this this great piece in in commentary, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read you a quote from it. Um, read you back your own words um, and you ask are. you to, to explain a little more what you mean. But um, you wrote. A generation of teachers, administrators, and policymakers has been trained, encouraged, and even required by law to view their work through the lens of racial disparity. The woke revolution rolling, roiling our schools with its Manichean view of oppressors versus oppressed is an overnight development that has been decades in the making. So yeah. I, I feel like, you know, we're focusing on this very 
specific sharp moment that essentially yeah. started last summer with the death of George Floyd that shined mm -hmm. shown a huge spotlight on these specific issues. But you point out in this piece that one, this has been going on for a lot longer than the last few months. And two, it, it has a lot of facets that are are beyond the surface, that that it's truly systemic in a way, which is the last uh -oh. favorite word. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 in that commentary piece, I, I, I stole a line from Hemingway. Uh, one of his characters described how he went bankrupt. And he said, gradually, then suddenly. Or he said, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And, and it's the same thing. I think we've arrived at this, this um, anti-racism moment. Uh, and I should make air quotes around anti-racism in two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And I, you know, I point out to people that you know, when I went to ed school 20 years ago and got my master's degree in elementary education, well, one of the, the graduation requirements in order to, to get my master's and teach and be certified was I had to demonstrate in my, you know, my, my portfolio of schoolwork a, quote, commitment to social justice. You know, that was 20 years ago. And, and you could trace this, you know, back far beyond that. Um, Checker Finn, my former top, uh, Fordham colleague, I think I may have quoted him in that piece, you know, loves to say that, uh, the, that, that, that progressives have, have always thought that schools were a swell place to, you know, to, to kind of, you know, impose their, their, their views on children. So, you know, I, I don't, I can't say with any degree of authority whether that is, you know, a dominant theory of, of education or the dominant theory of education, but it's quite widespread and it has been for, 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 for quite a while. I mean, any number of teachers, this is the water in which you swim, you know, and, and so, um, and I also point out, and uh, you were you know, kind of cite that commentary piece, that if you're under the age of 40, you've never known a day in your career where you didn't go to work thinking that my job is to close the achievement gap. I mean, that's 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 not the left. That's that's policy. That's stuff that that those of us on the right love. You know, that's that's um, accountability and standards and testing and whatnot. So, I mean, every impulse in American education, both in policy and practice for the last 20 years, has been to shine a harsh light um, on, on the so-called achievement gap and to, and to make policy and practice aimed at closing it. And that's not, a, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing, right? In other words, you know, we should be um, uh, disturbed by the degree to which it's difficult to be you know, black and brown in America and, and, and get your kid educated to the same standards as, as well-off white kids. That's, you know, that's, that's a scandal that, that we should be concerned about. You know, now the open question is, are we getting any better at closing it? And, and there the answer is, uh, well, the, the, the long answer is it's complicated and the short answer is no. Um, let's, let's talk a little more about, you said the water in which people are swimming in the education system has been um, certainly left of center, but let's say social justice oriented, or it's, I feel like every several years we come up with a new word for um, this type of thinking that then becomes tarred with a lot of people who dislike it. Um, yeah. And then they choose a new word, right? So we went from social justice warrior to uh, for political correctness to um, woke, woke uh, you know, yeah. the elect, which is John McWhorter's term. Um, yeah. So, but, but you point out that the water is essentially warm for these folks. Um, what are some of the but, things but, that create I, the, the tank, you know? If, if I can say so, it's not just for those folks, it's for all of us folks. In other words, um, you know, like, okay, so I, you know, I, I consider my ed reform credentials to be in pretty good order, even though I'm pr I've probably written more critically about education reform than, than anybody not named Diane Ravitch. I mean, but I can, I, I do it from within as opposed to throwing bombs from, from without, because I, I, I agree with the impulse. I mean, look, you know, I just told you my backstory that 20 years ago, I signed up to teach in, in the South Bronx. If I was not concerned with, uh, you know, the, the, the fortunes of low income kids of color, then I would not have signed up to do that. So, I mean, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a lefty. I, you know, this just struck me as, as being just decent fairness. In other words, I'm, you know, I, I said this somewhere else. I, I didn't sign up to smash or dismantle anything. I just signed up to try to make the system work a little bit more fairly. Um, so that's the dividing line. But, you know, a, a lot of us in this work, uh, we have the same concerns. We just have different ideas about how to to, to go about it. So I, I, I just completely avoided your question, Inez. I'm sorry. Can you, can, can you, <laughs> sorry, I just want, I wanted to correct your premise. Now I'll answer your question, but you have to remind me what it was. Uh, so what are some of the aspects that make up that tank of water, right? Um, so, you know, is does this have its roots in the university or ed schools, teacher training? I mean, what are the, the sort of planks? If you become a teacher and you decide that this is what you want to do with your life, as you did um, in yeah. your 30s, but as many people do straight out of college, right? Yeah. Um, 
that you want to become a teacher um, or you want to work in the education system in some way, what are the various ways in which you are pushed into this kind of woke positioning yeah. or, or lens okay. through which to see education? Yeah, I, I mean, it's if, um, and forgive me, I'm going to indulge myself with a lot of gray beard talk here, but 20 years ago, if you'd asked that question, well, you would have heard the answer is things like school choice, charter schools, specifically these so-called, we don't say this anymore, we don't call them no excuses schools, the KIPs, the Achievement Firsts, um, the Success Academies of the world. You know, uh, charter schools that were um, known for uh, rigorous curriculum, very regimented school uniforms, you know, kids being told to sit up, track the teacher, all this stuff. That was considered, and, and these schools were just you know, the, the, the prettiest girl at the education reform dance, so to speak. I mean, you know, uh, you could go back and Google like these glowing uh, media segments on, you know, of, of, of Kip on 60 Minutes, you know, um, uh, uh, magazine articles in, in the New York Times Magazine, etc. Uh, uh, movies like Waiting for Superman, etc. You know, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable right now how, 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 what a halo effect there was over this brand of education. Um, and that's completely changed. Somewhere along the line, probably about 10 years ago, there was kind of a counter-revolution, and it persists to, these day, to this day, where those schools were perceived as uh, militaristic, harsh, overly regimented, uh, a, a word that I hadn't heard until recently, carceral, uh, you know, meaning you know, in, in, like, prison-like. Um, so there, it's been kind of a, it just in the course of my 20 years in this work, just like a stunning reversal of, of, of fortunes, and to be, you know, complete the, the tale, a lot of these schools themselves have now repudiated uh, a lot of the work that they used to do, and they are among the most woke, so to speak. I mean, most famously, Kip a year ago or so uh, publicly renounced its "work hard, be nice" slogan. Uh, one of the founders, David Levin, uh, you know, issued this 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 letter that that honestly it sounded like it was the product of a struggle session. It was it was almost embarrassing. Um, the degree to which you know he held himself accountable for allowing uh, Kip to become—I uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, so I don't want—I may be careful uh, in quoting it. I think you know, uh, anti-black, uh, etc., engaging in white supremacy, um, you know, or elements of white supremacy culture, etc. I mean, just going all in on the kind of the current way we t talk about um, you know wokeness, I, I, um, uh, white supremacy, um, anti-racism, etc. So even even some of the you know the, the the schools and institutions that I would argue can most honestly claim uh, to be genuinely anti-racist are rowing as far away from this stuff uh, from 20 years ago as, as as they can. And and the open question is is this in the best interest of of the students they serve? You know, I, I want to be fair-minded here. I, I don't think we know yet, um, but I'm very, very skeptical. Um, as, I, as I've said elsewhere, if I thought this stuff was in the best interest of the children I've taught for the last 20 years, I'd say so, but I just don't think it is. You know, so a lot of the concepts that are integral to so-called no excuses charter schools, and just for the the audience that isn't as uh, embroiled in these kinds of education debates as we have been, um, those are schools that have, as as Robert said, a very regimented, um, strict culture. They they um, really demand a lot of students and from parents and from families, um, which Robert chronicles in his book on Success Academy. Um, and they can they they drill right. They drill kids. Um, uh, in, in everything from, you know, wearing the correct uniform, the socks with their uniforms to um, eventually, you know, mathematical equations. But what they do is produce test scores um, that are outstripping uh, wealthy, more white districts with a lot of kids who are coming from um, socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds and primarily are, are Black and Hispanic. Um, yeah. But I mean, so what... <laughs> It seems like there's an inherent contradiction here with all of the methods that schools, those kinds of no excuses charter schools get uh, to get what is their central kind of claim to fame, right? Which is closing that achievement gap and actually yeah. in fact putting disadvantaged students at the top of the pile um, in terms of test scores in, in, in the state. Um, if, if testing, as Ibram Kendi says, uh, if acknowledging an achievement gap is itself um, a, a form of racism, if, if uh, the Smithsonian Institute is putting out um, 
you know, documents that say uh, being on time and worshiping the written word are white supremacy. I mean, culture. how can yeah. how can KIPP and Success Academy um, and Democracy Prep go along with these, all these charter networks go along with those concepts when literally the keys to their success have been, especially as you chronicle in your book, building yeah. that kind of culture that prepares kids for learning, that exactly that bourgeois culture or whatever you yeah. want, to, want to call it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's curious and, and we should, you know, um, promise ourselves that we'll revisit this topic again in a year once once kids are back in, you know, in, in real school face to face with teachers and see if this dynamic doesn't doesn't change. Um, boy, you know, I, I could I could come at this a lot of ways, um, not the least of which is uh, if I want to be you know really candid about it, um, I think a lot of us in the ed reform movement have to confess or ought to confess that we have failed. In other words, if if the the impetus behind the classic ed reform movement was, um, you know, standards and accountability and testing are, is going to create this rising tide that lifts all boats as measured through test scores, well, if that was going to happen, we'd have seen it by now. So it's not going to happen. So the the, re the reason I, I I focus on you know urban charter schools, I've spent so much time, including in in the book that you nicely referenced, um, looking at at urban charter schools, is to my mind that that is the one clear unambiguous victory. Of, of the of, of the the ed reform movement in the last twenty years, we we've we've kind of you know not don't, don't don't have a lot we haven't put a lot of points on the board as a movement, but but that one we've gotten right. I mean, it's you you would much rather be a low income kid of color in a city with a with a vibrant charter school um, you know ecosystem now than fifty years ago. I mean, there's it's just, there's just no question about it. I mean, these schools as a as a category are just sending boxcar numbers of kids. Uh, to college that would not have gone a generation uh, ago. So, I mean, in, in my darker moments, I wonder, Inez, if one of the reasons that we are now having this kind of, you know, existential moment about anti-racism and, and the best way to educate uh, kids of color is not a direct result of that failure. Not not the charter schools, but but the, the, the reform movement in general. I mean, you know, you, 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 I could convince myself, I haven't given this a great deal of thought, but I could convince myself that if you put, you know, all the, 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 the smartest people on a problem and they fail, they, they need an excuse or not an excuse. They, they need to explain to themselves why, you know, they have never failed at anything, but they have failed to fix American education. So there must be, uh, you know, an explanation. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to tell stories out of school, but this happened publicly, so I'm, I'm not. I was on a panel some years ago, a few years ago, at AEI, ironically, where I now work with uh, with Howard Fuller, with um, uh, uh, Elisa Villanueva Beard, the, the 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 head of Teach for America, and she just started. This was when we first started describing, you know, this when when Ed Reform kind of had this extreme leftward tilt. I, I had the five years ago I'd, I'd written about this some, and she started saying these things like, you know, just describing the, the the systemic racism that kids were up against. And I said, wait a minute, hold on a second. Like fifteen years ago. We were the people who were saying and who were pushing back when the Diane Ravitches and the Richard Rothstein's of the world said, if you want to fix schools, you've got to fix poverty first. And we were the ones who said, no, you know, we're going to use schools to fix those things. Now we're saying the same thing, only instead of saying fix poverty first, fix racism first. And, and she, you know, took great umbrage and said, that's that's not what I'm saying at all. It's like, that's exactly what you're saying. So, I mean, the, you know, it, it, it does... If I sound frustrated, that's 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 not a, that's not by accident. It is rather frustrating that I think we have, in the main, kind of gotten this one right, and and we are repudiating rather, or we're at risk. I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. We are we are at risk of repudiating uh, and giving back the gains that we made on behalf of the students that I have you know, spent the last twenty years caring about. You know, there's another way um, in which this moment, I think, challenges ed reform and school choice and the things that, you know, you and I have spent, um, you, you even longer than I have, obviously, but I've spent the last decade, right, um, advocating for and still very much believe in as as a solution. But there's another challenge to that. Um, you know, the, the kind of things, the, the letters that Barry Weiss has been publishing mm. on her sub substack oh, from sure. teachers and parents in schools, private schools. Uh, where parents are are spending fifty four thousand dollars a year in tuition, um, and and are deeply unhappy with the fact that their kids are um, learning to view the world primarily through the prism of race, and to That's view right. their friends and um, their their um, you know next door neighbors primarily through the prism of race, and yet 
not to put too fine a point on it, but they're not doing anything about it except anonymously complaining. And oh, our entire movement has been based right. on the idea that if we empower parents with the ability to choose, that right, they will make um, their choices. These right. No, no. Uh, well, uh, thank you. And, and and let's put a fine point on it, shall we? Um, because um, okay, having having let, let let's let's keep a a board of how many people I can have set dur during our, our our talk. So I've now kind of you know out of the ed reform movement's disappointment. Now I'll go after the choice movement, even though, you know, I I, I make fun. Of things. I like choice. I'm a choice guy. Did I mention I'm a choice guy? Because I'm a choice guy. So when as I'm a choice guy, but this is this you know is to my mind just it, it just shows a bit of a, of of the bankruptcy of the model. I mean. If parents who literally could choose to send their kids anywhere, when, when you can pay $55,000 a year for a private school education, you, you truly enjoy unfettered choice. Um, you can move to you know, a, a school system that has you know, first rate schools. You can opt out of the public system. You can afford any public or any Catholic parochial private school under the sun. So your point is excellent. So Barry Weiss um, has been, and others have chronicled just these freakishly horrible stories about, you know, kids being separated into affinity groups, um, you know, kids being, you know, asked to, 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 you know, rank themselves by their privilege, et cetera. And, and to your very good point, not doing a damn thing about it, just seething um, privately. Um, so, so if, if, you know, if the choice model is, is the way to go, then why haven't these parents done what the model would predict that they would do, which is to vote with their feet. And if the, if the parents with the, the most choices are unwilling to do this, then what makes us think for a second that, that, that parents, uh, with fewer options and fewer resources, uh, are, are going to, to dem demonstrate the bravery uh, that that the, the the most affluent parents will not. Um, I, I I keep asking this question. I have not heard a satisfactory answer to it. So I'll I'll give you one potential answer. Push back a little bit. Um, I think the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room here is wanting to get your kid into Harvard. I think right? yeah, that, that's that's and, reasonable. And the role of universities um, in setting and this is a larger point about you know entering the managerial class uh, mm -hmm. of America, um, which is now largely woke, whether it's you know the corporate side of things or the education side of things or the academic side of things. Um, whereas there are millions and millions of middle-class Americans, um, I think they are, while they of course want their children to succeed, they also um, are probably more likely than some of these parents in these elite prep schools uh, you know, to prefer, for example, that their kids are not treated this way and that their kids ha sure. grow up with a healthy patriotism and love for the country that they grew up in than that they go to Harvard, right? And I, I think yeah. that's really what we're, what we're talking about here is what, what things are prioritized by which sectors of parents. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I've heard that explanation and it's plausible. In other words, if you perceive... The elite private school, you know, as as the golden ticket that's going to, um, you know, extend your privilege and get your get your kid into the Ivy League, um, then you're probably willing to hold your nose and go along with whatever it is, you know, whatever nonsense, uh, you know, that that private school is 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 offering because you know you have your eyes on the prize, so to speak. But now, let's take a longer view of that. If these schools are indeed these kind of citadels of wokeness, and I, I see no reason to think they're not. Well, then how much longer are they going to be interested in admitting, you know, the, the sons and daughters of, of you know, uh, upper uh, affluent white Americans regardless? In other words, what incentive does, does Harvard or Yale have to not try to identify, uh, the, you know, the, the kids from those outstanding urban charter schools that were, you know, that, that are at risk right now? Uh, because those, you know, if you, if you are going to uh, believe your own rhetoric about, about what it means to be anti-racist and equity, well, then those are the kids you should be seeking out and, and, and admitting. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, I mean, I, a couple of these private schools, I remember a few years ago, you know, a canary in the coal mine, the, the, the Dalton School in New York, I think, had no kids admitted to Harvard uh, for the first time in its, you know, in its, its entire history. And, and, you know, you would think that a, like a meteor was colliding with the earth for all the sturm and drang. Um, but, you know, they're, 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 I, I predict you're going to see more of that because, e in other words, either way you lose, you know, you're, you're, you're subjecting yourself at top dollar to your kid being subjected to an education that's anathema to your values um, in, in the hopes of getting something that you're, you might not get anyway. 
So, you know, at some point, when when do people of good conscience just stand up and say, wait a minute, this is this is not what I want. You know, I, I actually find that uh, explanation very optimistic in the sense that maybe I have a more pessimistic view. <laughs> I'm never uh, accused I of optimism. Think, I think that's, that that's, this will you. be, it'll be amazing how you see this ideology get twisted to essentially boost the fail sons and daughters of the elite, um, huh. that they're going to demonstrate their bona fides um, to Harvard by doing some kind of project in these prep schools, right? By by pledging the most fealty um, to wokeness and thereby perpetuating their own real pl class privilege, right? Um, to to yeah, be able I, to be admitted. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And, and look, you know, what, one of the things that you hear in our world is like, why are we spending all of our time talking about, you know, um, uh, well-off parents in, 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 in you know, the, the, the richest schools in the country? And, and, and I think that's right. I mean, you know, again, I'll, I'll say it for the 15th time, I'm a choice guy. I love choice. Um, but I'm also not willing to turn my back on the, you know, the 80 to 90 percent of kids who are still going to, to, to regular public schools and probably will for the foreseeable future. I mean, yeah, you know, I think we're seeing seeing more alternatives in a certain educational dynamism that's coming from choice. Um, but one of the, the 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 critical factors that underscores this entire discussion about um, you know whether it's critical race theory or anti racism is the fact that it is being imposed in some places on what is functionally a captive audience. So if yeah, point well taken. If the fifty five thousand dollar a year you know uh, Dalton school uh, wants to do this and the parents are willing to take it, well you know that that's on them. But when we start to impose it on um, on a captive audience of children who don't have choice, that's a different matter. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that captive audience. I mean, uh, it seems like uh, both sides in the critical race theory kind of clashes that are happening. You you think they both miss some critical information and, and knowledge about how the school system actually works, right? Because they yeah. think that it's about a battle over, for example, yeah. you cite the California Ethnic Studies curriculum um, you, that has a whole bunch of offensive stuff in there for for a variety of reasons. Um, but you basically say, yeah, these battles are perhaps important as a symbol, um, yeah. but functionally, what's in there is not going to change whether whichever side wins those battles, essentially, about what's in the curriculum, the former cur curriculum. Um, that doesn't matter as much as we think it does. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And this, you know, I, 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 I'm very fond of saying that every conversation about education either very gets gets very quickly to it's complicated or it's not worth having. And this may be the most complicated one. In other words, folks in our world where they work at think tanks or they're activists or advocates or whatnot, they, they have this impression that you can you know, do battle in state houses and get things, you know, the California Ethnic Studies uh, curriculum is a perfect example of this, um, you know, uh, pitch battles over, you know, what, what gets in, what gets taken out. And then people think they've accomplished something. So, so I, I point out, and, and this is not just my surmise, there's real data here. Um, you know, a, a, a RAND study from a couple of years ago, and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't quote it verbatim, but something on the order of 98% of elementary school teachers, 96% of secondary school teachers, like almost functionally every teacher in America, um, uses materials that they either create or find on a, on a daily or weekly basis. Um, that only like one in four say that, that their, their district's curriculum is their primary source of what they teach in social studies. Um, you know, the, the culture of teaching has essentially valorized um, you know, teachers forever calling audibles of the line of scrimmage, and not necessarily for bad reasons, you know, for, for, for differentiation, for engaging students, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I remember it being quite, a, quite remarkable and, and being surprised to learn that there was no such thing as academic freedom in K-12, that that's, you know, that's a higher education concept. There have been you know, decades of court decisions that give school boards uh, basically carte blanche to to dictate the curriculum, and teachers are uh, what, as many court decisions have said, hired speech. Um, so you you put all this in a blender, and you quickly realize, wait a minute, we, we have far less not to, not only far less control of what gets taught in a given classroom on a given day, but far less visibility. I mean, we it's shocking to me how little we actually know. Uh, about what gets taught on a given day, but we assume we know quite a lot. And, and um, I, I'm not even sure what to do with this information other than shed light on it. 
but but you know a lot of these battles that we're having right now over critical race theory over anti-racism etc over the ethnic studies curriculum make assumptions that are probably not true you know we we you can send signals about you know what matters and what doesn't but at the end of the day uh, there's shockingly little you know, for reasons both good and ill shockingly little command and control over what happens in your average k-12 public school yeah so for example you also as uh, by way of example you point out that the 1619 project oh, which was the example. previous iteration mm -hmm. of now we're talking about critical race theory before that it was the 1619 mm -hmm. project and a lot of these things all the ideas run in the same direction. Um, but that was what was uh, being taught in a ton of schools. You point out that they're, they're, um, the Pulitzer website uh, points out, says, I think they're in 4,500 schools in America. Every but you time write I look, it's piece. a bigger number. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost every, every, But you know, they, they claim that you know, thousands of, let's just say thousands of schools in all 50 states are, and, and I can't remember the language, but it's, it's, it's a little bit vague. Are, have, have downloaded or accessed uh, the, the work of Nicole Hannah-Jones and her collaborators. Um, now, I think it's a, it's a larger number now, but as of a, a couple of months ago, uh, there were exactly three school systems that had expressly authorized it for use. Uh, for memory, I think it was uh, Chicago, Newark, and Washington, maybe Buffalo as well, three, three of those four. So, so, I mean, right now, or that, that, that's a heck of a disconnect. So the Pulitzer Center says 5,000 there are exactly three that, that have said, no, uh, this is authorized for you. So they're not lying about the other 4,997. It's almost certainly teachers doing what teachers do, downloading, sampling, looking for something interesting to assign to teach a reading skill. So, you know, this is, this is culturally relevant. I'm going to use this, et cetera. But it's a perfect illustration of, of exactly this phenomenon that, um, you know, we, we, and how little visibility uh, we have. I, I, again, I don't think the Pulitzer Center is lying. Um, but but uh, I also um, I wouldn't uh, bet very heavily that many school boards are aware whether th this work is or is not being used. And not only that, but um, what context? Like, look, I, you know, I, I used to teach civics. I could easily see uh, using the 1619 project and using that as a unit question. When is the uh, the actual founding? That'd be a fascinating topic for for high school students to debate and read something from Nicole Hannah-Jones and read something from John McWhorter uh, and you know read some founding documents and, and have a really interesting discussion about the, 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 the theory here. Uh, that's not the same thing, obviously, as, as presenting as the unvarnished truth, you know, this is, this is what we believe in this gesture, the country was founded here or then or someplace in between. Um, if I'm painting a picture of, of kind of a, of a bit of a wild west in our schools, well, that's, that's kind of what we have. Um, so anybody who's listening to us who, who thinks that, you know, that, that they can exercise control from afar, um, well, good luck and Godspeed. That's just not the culture we have right now in schools. So what can parents do about it then, right? So if you are a parent who mm -hmm. is really unhappy about the fact that your kid is being split into an affinity group, yeah. um, what do you do? Do you go to the school board and demand yeah. they exercise the actual authority that they have? Yeah, that's that's a great question. We should talk about that. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I keep you know joking at my, about myself that I love school choice. Well, I also love a local control. And, and I mean that one too. Uh, this, we have the system that we have. 13,000 local school boards, and, and they have been recognized as the authorities to dictate curriculum uh, in, in their districts. So I'll tell you, if, if, I, if I were really, really concerned about, say, the 1619 Project or critical race theory or anti-racism, I would probably march directly to my school board and say, um, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a couple of questions for you. You know, what is, what is our stance in this district? What do we believe? When do we believe this country was founded? Uh, what is our our stance on you know? Uh, do you authorize this or do you not? Um, I, you know, I, I'm long out of the business of wanting to answer these questions on behalf of every school kid in America. Um, but I you know have enormous respect for 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 th that local control. So yeah, I mean, there's there if if there's a different answer in as than eternal vigilance and engagement, I, I simply don't know what it is. Yeah, I think that's what worries me about. Um the the critical race theory bills that are going through although um i think we, yeah. we can talk about this if you want i think we differ slightly on um whether or not we support them i, I tend to think that they're a good effort and they show something important about what parents are demanding what citizens are demanding from their public schools um but what i do worry about is that you know we're gonna we're gonna pass these laws and we're gonna declare victory um and largely go. the same materials whether 
under a different name or not, um, are going to keep coming in as supplemental materials. The teachers are going to con continue to be um, shaped and educated in schools of education that primarily yeah. teach racial through a racial essentialist lens, um, what I would call it. Um, yeah. And, and, and private disagree. schools are going to keep catering to the, the Harvard market, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, um, the, the end game here, and I think I would say this even if I were, if I were on the political left, is to not let K-12 education uh, devolve into an intellectual monoculture. No, nobody is well served by that. I mean, it's a bromide to say it's happened to higher ed, and it has, right? In other words, you know, try to find a conservative in the humanities department of a major university. Um, they're, they're either not there or they, or they, they stay silent. Um, so I think we, we should be concerned about um, a similar phenomenon in K-12. Um, you know, we, we, children sh should be, uh, and we can contextualize this uh, in terms of those kind of, you know, those anti-CRT bills that are wending their way through 20-odd through, through states. Um, you know, where, where I guess I disagree somewhat uh, with, with a, a lot of our friends and colleagues is, you know, I, I I don't like the impulse, shall we say, to, to, to ban an idea. I don't ever want to be associated with, with the idea that there are some topics that are just, just, just too hot to handle you know, among educated people. I think that's kind of anti-intellectual. But for the reasons we were discussing earlier about how little we know about what happens in classrooms, I just don't think they'd be effective. In other words, you can't ban an idea. And, and having said that, it's become kind of popular among folks on the left when you point out, you know, very the, the the parade of horribles, the kind of stuff that Christopher Rufo was writing about all the time happening in schools. The, the standard answer has become, well, that's not critical race theory. Or as somebody tweeted the other day, if your child is learning, you know, critical race theory, they're in law school. Well, that's probably right. You know, so in other words, you know, what, what's happening right now is not quote teaching critical race theory, but it's teaching within critical race theory. Uh, you know, so much has been said about, well, you really need to understand what it is before you critique it. Yes and no. Uh, you know, it, it, and again, I'll, I'll fall back on my 20 years in, in education and, and, and various initiatives come along. You know, back back in the day, it was, you know, it, it, it's social justice, it's anti-racism, it's critical race theory. It's It, it was critical, uh, culturally relevant pedagogies, cultural competence. There's different names for different, and 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 you know some people will kind of parse the differences between these, you know, like they're Talmudic scholars. I, I don't think that's as interesting as noting that they all kind of spring from a certain perspective uh, that is that is you know based in critical theory. So that's really the issue. It's not is my child quote learning critical race theory? Is is my child's teacher presenting a view of the world that is informed by 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 critical theory? And that's a lot harder to 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 to, to nail down. So again, you know, uh, I think one of the only answers here is transparency. Um, it's it's uh, shocking how little we know again about what's going on in um, in our children's school, but we should know more. I mean, it's just you know, at, again, at the end of the day, the vast majority of kids are being educated by public employees and government uh, funded institutions. It, it just should be unremarkable to know what the curriculum is. It should be, you know, I should be able to walk into any school in America and see the, the, the teacher's lesson plans. The teacher should be eager to show me the lesson plans because, you know, we know that engaged parents, you know, talking about what my, my kid learned in school today is, is a way to, you know, drive good results. So there's this kind of, you know, this big ball of mistrust right now for probably very good reasons, honestly. Um, but you know, it's it's a Gordian knot, I guess, is 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 what's going on right now, and we we are. It is slowly dawning on a lot of us how little we know and and how hard it is to find out about what our kids are doing all day, um, and it's and it's obscured by all these kind of technical arguments that we're having about well, what's critical race theory, and you know, is this curriculum okay, and is this book okay, it's, et cetera. So it's you know, we got a lot of digging to do to get to the bottom of this. I think there's a tension a little bit in what you said between pluralism of sort of an idea of, if not academic freedom, at least the plurality of different ideas and that there's sort of an, an ideal of for a teacher to um, present questions rather than answers. Um, but I mean, does the left have this one right in a way? Uh, what is the role of a publicly funded education system in a republic? And, and are we ceding ground when we say um, it needs to be, like, I believe in choices as, as in terms of, of um, 
and I believe in pluralism in terms of choice. Like I, I think that parents should have, that's one of the reasons I do think the role of choice here could be really important in exactly what you're talking about, which is forcing districts to actually pay attention to parents sure. because right now they don't have any. And I mean, the arrogance is simply shocking, right? We have yeah. districts complaining about having their materials FOIA requested. Right. Um, we have, you know, teachers on TikTok saying, you'll never stop me from, from teaching critical race theory to my students. And, and in fact, teaching them that their parents are um, a huge part of the problem and what we need to, to move away from. Right. So I think choice can help us with those things. It can help us with that completely arrogant attitude that a lot of school districts have towards the input of parents. Um, but there's there's a question here about, you know, we pay, all of us pay as citizens into this public system. As you say, it's staffed by government employees yeah. um, who are in the employ of the people of, of the country. I mean, are we sitting ground if we say that they shouldn't teach a sort of patriotic attachment to the country? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't teach facts about yeah. America's darkest, yeah. you know, um, sins and and um, problems. I mean, and I, I I honestly have never met this mythical person who doesn't want uh, American children to learn about slavery in this country, of right? Oh, but, I, yeah, no, no I, th I think that's right. There's there's so much demagoguery going on, frankly, on both sides, but. You know, from from the left, there's been a lot of. Um, I mean, there's, I can't remember who it was tweeted this the other day, and it got you know millions of retweets about how ironic it was that we're making Juneteenth uh, a national holiday at the same time we're forbidding teachers from talking about it. Well, that's just stupid. Of, of course, you know, there's there's nothing. I know I, I can't pretend that I've read all twenty odd bills that are wending their way through state houses, but I've not seen any language in any of them. Despite the fact that I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of these bills in general, but but let's not overstate the case, and let's not, you know, suggest that that uh, you know somehow we're outlawing any discussion of you know race or racism in in American schools. That's there, there, that's that, that's an unsupportable uh, position. But look, the, the 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 larger point that you raise is is one that I'm frankly wrestling with right now, which is. You know, if you think about it, you've got you know 3.7 million um, men and women in this country who are public employees, and and we're tasking them with a profoundly important job, which is to, I don't want to say raise children because that's the job of parents, but to incorporate children into the body politic, right? So you know, once you decide that your job is to somehow interpose yourself uh, in between children and and their community. Well, then, then, you know, that raises a lot of questions, not the least of which is where did you get the idea that you have the authority to do that? Um, because it's just kind of strange to think that, you know, the, the, the generous uh, taxpayers of your community are, are paying you to set your, their, their children against them. You know, that, that's, in other words, it, it starts to feel like we are, and I, I think I said this in the commentary piece, that 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 education is kind of drifting into conflict with 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 the, its support structures, in, in the way that you know an organism might devour its host. So you know th this is where I think we you know all of us have a lot of work to 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 really reckon. What exactly do we expect these things called schools to do? What is their role? Um, I mean, you know, the idea that it should cultivate patriotism. I'm personally very comfortable with that. I recognize that that a lot of others would not be for for reasons both you know for good and for ill, um, but we got to get really clear on that. You know it, what what exactly is the outcome that we're seeking uh, when we turn over our children at our own expense? You know for seven hours a day, five days a week, uh, one hundred eighty days a year. Um, surely it cannot be uh, to set those children about dismantling you know, the, the, the various institutions um, uh, of American life, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's, it, or it needs to be demonstrated to me that that is in the public interest. How about that? I mean, to take this one step further, not only are we uncomfortable with the idea that public schools would teach kids patriotism and love of country, which is now a very controversial statement, but I, I think would be a totally ordinary statement you know, even 30 years ago. Um, but uh, not uh, yeah. It, yeah, just saying, it, out it's, it's the founding purpose. I, I, I make a joke about this, you know, that, that Horace Mann went to his grave having never once uttered the phrase college and career ready. I mean, this was not what we created these, these, these schools for, you know, the, 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 the leading founding thinkers going back to, uh, you know, the 18th century and guys like Noah Webster and Benjamin Rush, 
the Benjamin Rush, Rush's phrase, I mean, it, it was, you know, that, that the schools were there to create, quote, Republican machines. You know, the, the, the founders understood quite well that republics tend to end, you know, in, in, in tears and tyranny, so to speak, that if we were going to have this novel experiment uh, called, you know, a democratic republic, well, we would need men and women capable of, of, of self-government. That, that implies the need for a, you know, pretty good education. But it was not about the private ends of, of uh, and I'm not dismissive of those private ends of college and career, it was about preparation for citizenship. Um, so, you know, we have drifted so far from, from shore now that we can't see shore anymore in that regard. Uh, but, but you, it doesn't take a great deal of, 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 you know, of, of imagination to see how some of the current notions we have uh, uh, about education are at cross purposes there. We are no longer seriously talking about preparation for citizenship. If anything, some of us are talking about, um, you know, raising revolutionaries, so to speak, you know, and that's, um, that's an interesting notion. Where'd you get that one? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was the justification in a country where so little was publicly funded, right, initially. Citizenship and the formation of citizens was the primary justification for public education at all. Sure. Um, but obviously, we're now uncomfortable with the concept of, of public education rearing patriotic citizens. Um, are we one step even more now uncomfortable with the idea, in some sense, of shaping children at all. There seems to be this um, almost Rousseauian notion, right? That uh, yeah. if if we provide boundaries and structure and um, and 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 a, a purpose in terms of citizenship and provide that kind of positive environment that we are somehow uh, dulling our, our kids, that we are um, preventing their creativity from coming into full flourishing. Um, yeah. You know things like student-led learning or, or or culturally relevant pedagogy, right, are really right. really popular mm -hmm. now. I mean, what is the proper role? Um, we talked about like debates between parents and schools as to who has the role of shaping children, but um, is that kind of assuming that we ought to shape them at all? I mean, to what extent is that idea popular that we have well, no they, right to? They they the schools will shape children. Period. In other words, they can't not. So, so the, the the question becomes: Do you want to be intentional about this, or do you still just kind of want to, you know, let it happen organically? Um, it's interesting. Um, this was an unexpected lesson uh, in in the year that I spent observing in Success Academy uh, for the book that I I, I wrote. Um, and I think I may have said this directly in the book. I walked in expecting to write a book about curriculum and instruction because that's just generally what I write about. And I, I somewhat surprised myself, almost accidentally, writing a book about school culture, which is not, you know, an area that I, that I've really focused on. Speaking of, you know, the water in which you swim, um, but this is this becomes another argument for choice. In other words, you know, part of the the reason that I, I'm a, I'm a choice advocate, even though I may not be an orthodox choice advocate, is exactly these reasons of character formation. Um, you know, schools are going to, you know, kids are going to pick up signals about. Um, you know, I mean, what's the definition of, of culture, how we do things around here, you know, they're, they're, they're going to pick up those signals one way or the other. So do you want to choose a school that has, uh, you know, a deliberate school culture that reflects your values? Do you want to take the risk of sending your kid or having your kid assigned to a school that, that, that contra contradicts those values, you know, even cast, a, cast aspersions on them? So, so issues of, of values is probably the strongest argument for, for um school choice. I mean, I, I kind of gently mock some of our, our school choice colleagues who love to point out test scores and whatnot. Um, and and uh, I, I'm not sure that's the best argument for, for, for choice at the end of the day. I think school culture is a better argument for choice. I, I, I want to send my kid to a school uh, you know, where, where the signals they get, patriotism or not patriotism, you know, character education, et, et cetera. You know, we're, we're, we're at the very least, I can send my kid to school knowing that, that the, the, the way I raise my child is not going to be contradicted by, by the experience he or she is having at school. You know, uh, you're actually anticipating my, my final question I wanted to ask you, which is, you do focus exactly on school choice. I mean, uh, school culture. Pardon me. Um, school culture in this book, and and you talk about in other places in your work about how important it is to have a common body of, in in this case, substantive knowledge, and then also those those commitments that make up a school culture, right? So these things that are are perhaps not universal, but are pretty close to it, right? You can sort of tolerate a few um, dissenters within a, a body of of people. Um, 
but not too many, right? Or you lose yeah. that that culture. I mean, it seems to me that there's probably some lesson to draw there for the country as a whole, right? Yeah. Um, to yeah. what extent is that kind of cultural, uh, the, the quote unquote school culture or the country culture, right? Um, necessary to, to hold together a nation. And do we have anything that remotely qualifies as that in America anymore? Um, we, we don't, or, or we're in danger of losing it. Look, you know, I, I am a unapologetic uh, disciple of a guy named E.D. Hirsch Jr., uh, who, um, you know, has influence. My, my work is his work at the end of the day. I, you know, I've never had an idea about education that he didn't have first and, and better and more comprehensively. Um, he is, uh, you know, best known as the author of Cultural Literacy. Um, and he's also been kind of, you know, uh, been done dirt, so to speak, by the educational establishment who, you know, they associate him with this, you know, kind of wanting to establish a, you know, the, the, the canon of dead white males, et cetera, et cetera. And if you, if you know Hirsch's work, it's, it's not really about that whatsoever. It's about language proficiency. It's about the idea that um, uh, uh, skillful reading and, and language comprehension rests for complicated reasons that we can talk about for hours another time. On, on shared knowledge uh, that, you know, E.D. Hirsch in one sentence that, that uh, writers and speakers make assumptions about what their readers and listeners know. And when those assumptions are correct, language is fluid and, and effortless. And when, uh, when those assumptions are incorrect, it falls apart. Um, that, that, that implies that our schools have a very important job to do of making sure that we all leave at age 17 or 18 more or less with the same body of knowledge. Um, and that's just a fact. In other words, it, you, you can't, language does not care what we think. You cannot change that about language. So you, you have to reckon with that. And, and you know, th this is both a failure uh, of the choice movement in, in not wanting to reckon with this and, and the anti-racist and, and cultural uh, uh, and, and CRT audience in wanting to, to valorize a curriculum that is, that is say, completely Afrocentric. Um, neither one of those polls are reckoning with what we know and what Hirsch has taught us for 40 years about language proficiency. But it does imply, right, that in order to stitch together a diverse nation, that we need to take this seriously, regardless of, of whether you go to a Catholic school, a private school, a home school, et cetera, um, that, that it's important that every child, in order to be a functional adult and a responsible citizen uh, in, in our country, needs to be on the kind of the same cognitive page with, with everybody else. That doesn't happen organically in a diverse country. Now, other countries, interestingly enough, have a better answer to this. I shouldn't say better, but, but a, a more common answer, which is it's, it's, it's uh, the, the work of Ashley Berner at Johns Hopkins has been eye-opening for me in this regard. You know, she points out that most other countries tend to be more pluralistic than we are. They have you know, far different or a wider variety of schools, mostly government funded, but they all tend to have a national curriculum, something that would make E.D. Hirsch quite happy. But, th but, but that is literally a non-starter in our country because we have this, that, that pesky little document called the Constitution, uh, which, which prevents us from, from having a national curriculum. But here we go again. I guess this may be the theme of this conversation is it places a great burden on us as educated men and women to, to ensure that these things happen, not by imposing it, but by recognizing that, hey, this is, we've been entrusted with an awesome responsibility here to make sure that, that, we, that, that kids leave us with this body of knowledge. We can't make you do it, but if you don't do it, there's gonna be a downstream con uh, consequence to that. So, you know, it, it, all roads lead to eternal vigilance. All roads lead to, you know, nobody's gonna do this for us, impose this on us, we've gotta do it ourselves. Yeah, I think that's really uh, a great note to end on in terms of, of the theme of the podcast, right? I think overall has been eternal vi vigilance is important and there's no substitute for bravery. There's no substitute for for courage um, in these fights. But thank you so much, Robert, for your time on this podcast. Um, you can find more of Robert's work at AEI um, or you could buy his book uh, on, on Amazon or anywhere else uh, where books are sold. Um, and thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to inez.stepman at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave. We'll see you next time on High Noon.